Lucinda has assured me that once I start speaking, everyone will rush to take their seats. And lo, it worked. That's great. Fantastic. Um, welcome to our first panel session of the day. It's that time of year when I get to uh, channel Kirsty Wark. Those of you who know me will be familiar with the fact that I like to kind of get into this sort of role. Um, this is our State of the Nation session. We're going to look at the big picture, the economy, our political institutions, the housing crisis, to gain a better understanding of what that means for housing associations as key partners of government and as major contributors to the local economy. To help us do that, I'm delighted to introduce our panel. We've got Jim Fitzpatrick, broadcaster, producer and journalist, formerly with the BBC, Paul McElean, Managing Director of MCE Public Relations and Chair of the Cathedral Quarter Trust and Groundwork NI, and Tim Montgomery, Conservative Party supporter, blogger, commentator and columnist with The Times. A recent article in The Economist defined Britain's three biggest problems in the run-up to the general election as the gaping deficit, a chronic housing shortage and shrinking real wages. Tim will hopefully give us a sense of how the Conservatives, Labour and Liberal Democrats are planning to address those challenges in the run-up to the general election. And here in Northern Ireland we're facing a financial crisis of our own, a shortage in housing supply and lower wages in the rest of the UK, all complicated by a, an apparent unravelling of the political institutions. Jim and Paul are hopefully going to tease out some of the issues around the local economy and the political stalemate. This is a bit probably where your speakers are listening to you and going, is that what we were supposed to say? Is that what you told us to say? But no, hopefully we'll get through some of those issues. So I'm going to just outline how we're, we're structuring this session this morning. Our three speakers are going to say a few words on those various aspects of UK and local politics, the economic position now and looking ahead, and a little bit about housing and regeneration policy. That's really to provide you with some context for a panel discussion that will allow us to delve more deeply into those issues, the ones that concern you most. It's going to be a very interactive session. I hope you all had lots of coffee in the break there. And we're going to try and pack as much into the next hour and a quarter as we can. So once our panel finish their opening comments, I'm going to be looking to you in the audience to comment or ask questions. So please raise a hand if you want to contribute to the discussion. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul McElean. Uh, good morning. Uh, I feel like uh, the guy uh, that doesn't have any um, swimming um, uh, aids on, but who actually can't swim. Um, and I'm going to also just uh, preface this by saying that I don't have a script, because when I had a script at a conference uh, organised by your speaker uh, later on, Marching and Willier, last week, uh, I proceeded to read the script and be very uh, sort of... Um, provocative in what I was saying and had him at the bottom waving at me, telling me to shut up and sit down and all the rest of it. So when we get to 10 minutes, I've instructed Jenny to tell me to sit down and I will sit down. Um, what I'm going to try and do though is talk a little bit about uh, the political climate, a little bit about the challenges that there are for housing associations as we see them from a political perspective, uh, a little bit about uh, the future and, and then lastly talk a little bit uh, from a sort of a PR and, and sort of a public affairs perspective around what you might do in terms of messaging, uh, communicating, connecting uh, on that front, uh, uh, provide some, some thoughts on that front. So we just had the minister and I thought he was very refreshing, I must say, I haven't seen him in action yet. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that, that it's probably useful given what's happened uh, with the last minister and the controversies uh, on, on various fronts uh, that overlapped into the housing sector that uh, you have a, a new minister and a fresh start and uh, albeit there's, not, there's no big change from a policy perspective and there were some interesting things he said there. I think for you uh, and indeed for the, the sort of Department of Social Development, it's a refreshing change. Um, I think the, the, the broader political environment at the moment, and you probably don't need me to tell you, is not positive. It, it isn't good. Uh, there are many things going on and a number of quite negative dynamics uh, taking place uh, at the moment. Which, which don't really make for a, a positive political environment. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, the appointment of a new US envoy, the start of the talks, which didn't really start well, the non-appointment of, of a speaker, uh, and a number of other issues, don't make for a political environment that is particularly positive. And I think, you know, obviously Jim's gonna talk about the, the financial pressures there as well. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the, the current environment is not good. That's not to say that you can't um, push on in, the, in your area 
which is extremely important both to um, the constituents of the, of the politicians but for society as a whole in Northern Ireland. And I think uh, that the, the, the environment is what you have to deal with. It, it hasn't been positive here for a very long time. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, the housing sector and the housing associations and NIFA have started to prosper and really push forward their agenda. So you can make progress even in a, a negative political environment. I think obviously the other big thing uh, coming over the horizon, and I do understand I was at a meeting yesterday um, about uh, Belfast City Centre issues with, with the council and uh, a number of DSD officials and others, that um, there has been some talk in relation to a delay in the implementation of uh, uh, local government reform and its implementation or its start date of the 1st of April uh, next year. I understand that that is one of the issues that will be on, you know, big on the agenda at the executive meeting today, that there may well be um, a, a decision one way or the other. Uh, but that was some of the, the messaging coming through from officials uh, at a meeting I was at yesterday. But obviously, given the, the, the regeneration part, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the regeneration and housing bill um, at the end, uh, there is there is a serious implications for you guys in relation to uh, local government reform and indeed many great opportunities. I know many of you are already talking to your council, very good relationships with your councils already. Um, in terms of what uh, we, we did, I, I have some of my team who, because we're speaking to MLAs and uh, party officials and so on um, virtually every day in our business, uh, well, I got them to go and do a little straw poll uh, on NIFA and ask a few questions. And, and some of the comments that you, that you see, and, and it's, it was a fairly mix, uh, it was a good mix of political parties and a good mix of geographies uh, in there as well. So those are just some of the comments. But you know, it's kind of things that probably wouldn't surprise you, um, need to connect more with local communities, need to understand better uh, what's going on and uh, con consult early uh, in the process. Um, need to uh, connect greater, in a greater way and with greater depth uh, with the politicians themselves and let them understand uh, what you're about. You know, the types of things that you've probably heard before um, and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, you know the, the messaging and how you get it across, when you get it across, who you get it across to are all things that came through in that. And certainly, you know, you're not without your challenges. I think the, uh, the, the, the sort of the... Housing, uh, and, and it's kind of interesting that, that Cameron was talking about 1974 there, and, and I was born in 1974, I'm afraid to tell you, uh, and I was also born in 1972, and Alan was just talking about it uh, when you know, we had the last sort of major local government reform. And you know, housing was one of the big issues that, that, that started that, uh, and the housing executive um, was one of the great pillars uh, of, of, of strength and hope through the troubles in the sense that it was taking out uh, depoliticized housing and the Ireland housing executive was extremely successful in doing that and has been and continues to be so. But the, I noticed that the Sinn Féin um, uh, candidate for, for Manus South Tyrone uh, for next year's Westminster election uh, is Michelle Gilderney. And as many of you will know, Michelle was the baby in the house in Caledon. That, that helped, you know, was one of the sort of very starting points uh, of our troubles and one of the biggest difficulties. And as we go into local government reform now, and the way in which, you know, you guys have been caught in the transfer or caught in the crossfire to some extent, not literal uh, anymore, thankfully, uh, of of housing being used uh, as a as a as a sectarian battering ram, or indeed uh, as a way of of ensuring or stopping uh, votes in certain areas. I think the, the, the sensitivities around local government reform uh, next year and indeed the, the role of housing in that uh, is coming to the fore. Um, I, and I will speak a little bit about that uh, uh, when I get on to the, um, the regeneration in housing bill. I think the, the, the developer contributions thing is a, is, a, is, a big, is, a, is a big issue as well. We've some pretty considerable exposure in our business uh, to the private uh, development sector. Uh, and I think you know, there's a very serious lobby uh, there. Well, I know there's a very serious lobby that says that the uh, recovering private housing market is not ready for uh, developer contributions as set out in the consultation paper. And some of you um, uh, are probably aware and will have seen maybe some of the consultation responses from the private sector in relation to that consultation. So that, that issue has got a long road to run. Uh, and I think the, the uh, you know, early implementation of that developer contributions at PPS 22 uh, 
I think um, will be a challenge for you, and I don't think it'll happen, certainly I don't think it'll happen the way it's set out uh, in, in the early consultation papers, and I think that's probably recognised. Um, and I think obviously there's a big, big, big hurdle to jump in, in letting people understand uh, the benefits and value of mixed tenure housing. Um, uh, not, not just uh, cross-community housing and the Newington example, and some of my colleagues are here from, from uh, Groundwork. Uh, you know, the Newington example is just an absolutely wonderful story. I, I've walked through that development, it's incredible, uh, and it's a brilliant thing that's happened. Um, but the other big challenge, though, was mixed tenure housing uh, and getting people's heads around that, getting the private sector's uh, head around that is a, is a big challenge for you guys. And part of, I suppose, how I see, uh, just from our little uh, piece of analysis that we did in advance of this discussion, uh, you know, one of the big sort of future issues that you have, and I've set out some of the other ones there. Just to jump, just to say a little bit uh, also then about the, the regeneration and housing bill, and, and I understand uh, that part of the big um, problem in this dates back to what I've just said in relation to housing uh, as a political tool uh, and as something that was abused uh, in the old councils uh, before the reforms uh, in 1972. And I, and I understand that there is you know, a disagreement between Sinn Féin and the DUP in relation to uh, the level of, of uh, um, uh, housing uh, wordage, et cetera, uh, and, and the emphasis on housing within regeneration. So regeneration is good. I think the, the, certainly the bigger councils are absolutely down to get their hands in regeneration. Uh, and, and you know, there's, I've been involved from a Cathedral Quarter Trust perspective in quite a lot of discussions. I mean, uh, the Cathedral Quarter Trust and indeed Groundwork is involved in some community asset transfer work that DSD is pioneering, and a number of other really, really, really good initiatives that will, you know, bring uh, in the spirit of subsidiarity, uh, you know, proper decision making on regeneration issues down to down onto the ground. And the councils are very well. Some of the councils are very well placed to deliver that, but. That is, uh, uh, and a copy of the slides are available, I'm not asking you to read it all, but that is as much as we know. Obviously, the minister was silent uh, on it in his speech there, uh, probably um, quite justifiably so, and uh, that is an assembly answer uh, last week. Lastly then, I just want to talk a little bit about messaging, and when we think about messaging, when we're trying to advise clients, we try to think about um, who can say the, the power, what we call the power of third-party endorsement. If you've got tenants, if you've got the housing sector, if you've got the, the, the building sector, if you've got others, PwC, although that's not their job, but um, uh, research reports are very, very important in helping uh, with an argument. But if, you're, if other people are making the case for you, then, you're, then your messaging is far more compelling. And if they're doing it based on research or doing it based on fact or evidence, it's even more compelling. So people will expect you, the housing associations, and indeed NIFA, to say great things about yourselves, to put yourselves up with the hard hats on and say, here, break the sod, etc. Those are symbolic occasions and they need to be recognised. But to use other people to convey your message and to do that in a simple way and an evidential way is probably you know, a very, very strong, well, it is a very, very strong, compelling way for you to get your message across. I think the other thing is, in terms of engaging with local communities and, and this is something that we do uh, a lot of, I suppose. Um, you know, we represent the likes of Sainsbury's and Northern Ireland for all their new starts. And, and they're, they're, we, we, I mean, I think the, 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 the absolute best, best in class example of this is, is a piece of work that we've been doing for about a year and a half. It's called First Flight Wind, which is Northern Ireland's only offshore wind project in South County Down. They consulted about how they wanted to consult at the start. They asked the local community about what is the best way to engage with you. They did three months of that before they actually started their consultation process. I mean, that is, if you want to look at it, uh, an absolutely brilliant example of how to consult. I mean, like building wind farms off the coast of South County Down is not a straightforward matter by any means. There's all sorts of issues in there in terms of marine ecology, fishing, uh, visual um, visual impact, etc. But in terms of the steps that are required. I've set out there on, on, on a slide a little bit of, 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 of info about how we would approach it and how we advise on these things. And I suppose if, you, if the intent is there, if you do it early, if you reach out to the right people in a way that works for them, not that works for you, so you have to come at it from the other, from the other direction and, uh, and do it in different ways through workshops, through written material, through door-to-door, -door, through surveys, 
and digitally, i.e. Uh, online, um, through social media, through a website, through Facebook, etc. Those are all different ways in which you can do it, and they have to be part of a strategy that's developed early and in conjunction with the communities that, that you're working with. So uh, that's all I have to say. I'm very happy and looking forward to a, a, a proper discussion. Thanks very much. more in our sessions after lunch because uh, the Minister talked about freeing us up through regulation to do more, removing some of the constraints and the more compliance based aspects and currently housing associations have to follow a certain process in how they consult with communities but actually to do it more constructively we should be doing it on their terms rather than ours or governments. So certainly that will be something that stays with us. Um, Jim, I'm going to hand over to you now, thank you. Thanks uh, very much. Uh, Jenny, yeah, when you were outlining earlier on there about what it was we were supposed uh, to speak to today, I was reminded of those occasions when you're interviewing politicians and you ask them a question and then they don't really answer the question at all. And you say to them, you know, could you answer the question? And they say, I am answering the question, Just let me finish. And then, you know, the, usually my follow-up was, yes, but could you please answer the question that I asked? Um, but uh, so I'll try and do uh, what Jenny has asked me to do. Uh, today and uh, sort of maybe give a little bit of an economic uh, look, some sort of just top line figures and sort of where things might be heading for us. Um, and let me do something that I suppose we don't often do uh, in journalism. Let me start with the good news. Uh, so the UK has the fastest growing G7 uh, economy at the moment. Uh, unemployment is falling too across the board. Good news on the jobs front this week in Northern Ireland. We had the official rate of unemployment just, just last week coming out. Uh, telling us that in Northern Ireland it fell to 6.1%. The number on the dole was down to by 300 in the month and nearly 10,000 down over the year. And meanwhile, the Northern Ireland Composite Economic Index, and that's a kind of government measure uh, of how we're doing. Uh, we don't have GDP figures, uh, so we have other measures for regions to try and tell us how we're getting on. And for the second quarter of the year, it showed an increase of 0.3%, uh, and there was an increase of 1.2% over the whole year. Activity in the private sector was estimated to have increased by 0.4% in quarter two compared to quarter one in 2014. So some pretty good economic stats there telling us that things are getting better. And in Dublin, uh, so we have a trading partner if you like, if you consider the GB market as a trading partner uh, with Northern Ireland, obviously part of the UK, but in terms of people selling goods and services, uh, the number one market, the second market then uh, is the Republic of Ireland, uh, and it's doing pretty well too. Uh, Dublin, uh, you know, is growing uh, so fast that they're worried again about another property bubble. Uh, the Irish government have effectively declared an end to austerity. Those were the international headlines. Uh, Ireland declares an end to austerity with its budget uh, just a couple of weeks ago. A clever budget uh, designed to put a smile on people's faces and perhaps, uh, you know, ease them towards a general election. And the Irish economy is now currently growing so quickly that if the government is to meet its own growth target, it's going to need a recession in the second half of the year. Uh, so you can look at all those measures, or you can actually you know, take the, the, what I think is usually the, you know, possibly one of the most uh, reliable measures of all, ask a taxi driver. And uh, so I did this last week when I was in Dublin, and I was told that, yep, yeah, things were absolutely heaving, no sign of austerity, no sign of a recession. So that's where we are. That's where we are with our trading partners, with our biggest markets, and you know, how does that impact then on everything we're doing here? Well, let me just see if, yeah, I thought what I'd do, since we're at a housing conference, uh, is talk about uh, houses. <laughs> I've got three different houses I want to show you uh, through this uh, short talk. Uh, the first one uh, you'll recognise, of course, as uh, the House on the Hill, Parliament Buildings, and there it is. It looks beautiful, as it often does, really, depend, you know, it really doesn't even matter what the weather is, it always looks quite stunning, perched up on the hill there, but there it is in the middle of a kind of uh, a winter, uh, potentially a nuclear winter. Uh, Stormont has avoided default, it seems, with its own little sort of tapping of George Osborne for 100 million quid to tide it over, sort of Wonga-style loan until payday <laughs> in March. Um, and this money, of course, fills the gap that's been created partly, uh, but not exclusively, by the failure uh, to deal with welfare reform. It's also to do with things that have been building up in the system. Uh, and it sort of papers over those cracks, buys a little bit of time. 
Uh, there are dire warnings, however, as we all do, for further cuts to come, whatever the 100 million joins the other cuts that are building up uh, for next year. And of course, in the meantime, they have to agree a budget uh, for 2015-16. It's partly because, it's because of the extension of the uh, term at Stormont, uh, so the programme for government in the original budget doesn't cover uh, the last year, uh, and that means they have to pretty much agree it all from scratch. Now, there's so much goodwill up there, you know that that's going to be an easy task. So, things are going to get a bit tighter. 100 million extra to be sorted out next year, no problem, you might say. You know, it's hardly a huge amount in the scheme of things, considering the annual uh, DEL spending, which is about uh, 10,000 million. So, it's 1%. Uh, 1 percent, I suppose, in a normal organization, suggested to any of you perhaps, running your finances in your own associations, you probably think 1 percent, you could live with that. You could, you could cut 1 percent. You'd probably be happy enough uh, at times if it was only a 1 percent cut. I'm sure you've seen much worse at times. But Stormont is a different kind of beast. And I suppose we've seen a lot of screaming, a lot of shouting uh, over the past number of years about how tight the finances are, a lot of noise about the squeeze on public finances. Uh, but I suppose the, the irony is, is that the squeeze hasn't really begun. Uh, and this is the problem. This is really what we're seeing now is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the welfare reductions, the penalties, the payday loans, uh, these are essentially just self-inflicted wounds ahead of the real cuts which are to come. Stormont's spending power has remained broadly flat during this entire period of austerity. And that means, you know, it's remained the same. And again, I don't know about you, but if my income remains the same, even if prices are going up a bit, I notice things a bit tighter, but I don't automatically scream poverty. Uh, Stormont did. Uh, austerity has been to blame for so much, we're led to believe. Uh, so we have to wonder uh, who will get the blame or what will get the blame now that austerity is actually about to kick in. Uh, the real cuts are only just beginning, and that's something that uh, everybody's going to have to face, anybody who deals with the public sector. Public sector employment uh, is pretty much where it was pre the financial crisis. It's actually gone up recently here in Northern Ireland. Uh, so the pay for the many in the civil service uh, may have continued to rise due to annual increments despite the pay freeze. And I know it's something that uh, the Chancellor George Osborne has been, has been looking at. Uh, but this won't continue. And that's not really a political statement. Uh, it's not really even a, a major prediction uh, about the outcome of the next election. It's essentially just a certain fact based on what we know at the moment. Uh, despite the growing UK economy, the government is suffering its own form of cost of living crisis. Wages aren't growing, so tax isn't increasing. The Chancellor has been borrowing more money this year uh, than he wanted to. He said he won't raise taxes, and that means he's going to have to cut more from public spending. Uh, Ed Balls has said as much, uh, he's said it perhaps in a different tone, uh, but Labour isn't making big spending promises. They've said they'll balance the books with less coming in, and that means there'll be an awful lot less going out. So the other house we have to think about in all of this is Westminster. What will happen at Westminster? How will it drive the public finances here in Northern Ireland? And uh, how will that impact on, on everything that, uh, that you're doing here? The fact is, I suppose, that austerity, uh, regardless of who occupies uh, government in that building uh, post the next election, is here until 2020. So we have to get used to it. So these are the challenges that uh, are faced to anybody here in the local economy, uh, whether you're dealing with the public sector or the private sector. The challenge for business in this context is to make profits, uh, to run their affairs in an environment of subdued or constrained consumer spending, and indeed constrained public spending. And it's hard to see that the boom days would return. You know, here in Northern Ireland, I suppose that's going to mean simply for everybody, and I'm not just talking about uh, housing associations, it's going to mean everybody having to work harder and more efficiently. Uh, for those that can, it will mean uh, seeking out new markets. For those that have relied on the public sector, it will mean tougher negotiations over contracts, price perhaps being driven down. Uh, it may also op open up opportunities though. Uh, a wise government at Stormont would consider what outputs it would like to achieve and then find the most efficient and effective way to do that but perhaps we don't have a wise Stormont. Uh, we have a Stormont that protects public sector jobs at all costs and neglects service in the process. So why do I say that? Well, let me give you just one little example. Uh, we had a recent case of DVLA jobs moving uh, from Coleraine uh, to Wales. Now, 
Uh, nobody wants to see jobs leave the local economy. Obviously, the spending power that those uh, people have is good for the wider economy, and it's obviously good for them and their families. Uh, but you know, what is it that government is there to achieve? In this case, we had an SCLP minister. Uh, he wanted to save the jobs, which we can understand. Uh, however, in order to protect those jobs for a limited period, because it was ultimately a futile battle, the minister blocked moves to allow uh, uh, one thing, for instance, the online taxing of cars and other services which most consumers uh, would have deemed a big improvement. So what we have here is the taxpayer who is funding the jobs is denied the service that they deserve in order to keep the jobs that they're paying for. And that's where the political priorities tend to lie, regardless uh, of the party. You might get uh, maybe different nuances. And, you know, to be fair, in some areas, maybe there are different uh, policies and different approaches. But broadly, within the coalition at Stormont, uh, that is essentially where uh, the parties sit. Nobody, for instance, whenever the opportunity was presented to them under the last government to make big efficiency savings, decided to do that and to reinvest those savings, which they would have been allowed to do. So uh, the idea that uh, you, know, that you were going to see uh, any of the parties wanting uh, to take uh, big steps like that without essentially being forced to do so, uh, I suppose, is maybe wishful thinking. So the private sector, I suppose, uh, has a capacity to do its bit, the third sector also. Uh, and uh, I suppose what we have to wait and see is, will they be given the opportunity? So here we are in this room with uh, different people representing uh, housing associations and, and all of that that you want to achieve. We know, uh, for instance, that you've collectively raised 600 million in private finance. We know you have assets worth about three billion, and that's a pretty pretty big, uh, you know, pretty big asset base in a small place like Northern Ireland. So you're considering today, I suppose, what is it you want to do uh, in this new environment? Provide more housing. Uh, meet the needs for savings uh, within the budget at the same time. And I suppose your problem is, to some extent, uh, there is then this political debate that we return to. Uh, is it you, know, you versus the public sector? Is it you versus uh, the housing uh, executive? Uh, you know, and I think that can you know, often dominate the headlines rather than perhaps uh, you know, a better debate, which is what is it that uh, the taxpayer wants? What is it that people that use your services want, what is the best way of delivering things to everybody, regardless of who provides that. Uh, so that's something that, that I suppose Paul was, was touching on, how you position yourselves uh, to, to put your arguments. I think you're going to have to be doing that a lot more, and it'll be interesting. Those arguments will have to be heard because the financial pressures will force those issues onto the agenda. Uh, perhaps you have to do a better job of explaining how you leverage more money to build more houses for less. Uh, again, you know, and somebody who worked uh, at the BBC as an economics editor uh, in Ireland and also previously uh, in politics uh, for a long time, uh, I'm well aware that uh, economic issues don't often grab the headlines. Often the political debate crowds out everything else, and so therefore you don't really get time to drill into the detail on these things. Uh, however, uh, you know, that perhaps just you know, raises the challenge to you in terms of trying to explain your position uh, to perhaps uh, a media, a local media, that is often more obsessed with, uh, I suppose, orange and green politics rather than what might be seen as the bread and butter issues, which are dealt with in more detail uh, in other places. Uh, I suppose the other thing you have to be uh, mindful of is that you will, uh, you know, and you often have been in the past, be portrayed uh, as the bogeyman, as people seeking a kind of land grab or a power grab, or, uh, you know, and those are the issues that uh, will have to be discussed. Uh, but I suppose ultimately it will be a choice uh, between you know, fewer houses uh, under old models or uh, perhaps more houses under new models. And uh, that's what's going to be interesting in the time ahead uh, to see how that debate rolls out. Just want to show you one more house. Um, that uh, is a sort of typical uh, little street. Now we're talking a lot about dates here today, 1974. Uh, this is actually 1971. Uh, that's the year I was born. Uh, I wasn't born twice, by the way. You seem to be <laughs> born on two occasions. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's the year I was born. Now, you know that there's a film out at the moment, uh, 1971. It's got great reviews. Uh, it's a gritty portrayal of life on the streets of Belfast for a young soldier uh, in that early year of the Troubles. Uh, I'll just give you, you know, the, you can see the, the image there. 
Uh, and uh, I'll give you just a couple of reviews that I picked up from uh, The Guardian. Apologies, Tim, I need to check uh, what The Times uh, were saying about it as well. Uh, this is from a former IRA man, Anthony McIntyre, and he said, the impact of 71 was immediate. To use the well-worn phrase, a journey back in time. The screen immediately saturated my mind with powerful ambience and stunning effect, both visual and audible. And then former UDR soldier Arnie Brown told The Guardian, certainly brought back memories, and it was good to see that the producers had made a good effort to ensure realism. They've got rave reviews. The era is perfectly recreated. But here's the thing. That's not a picture of Belfast. That's a picture of Blackburn. Uh, the producers couldn't find a location in Belfast to recreate mm -hmm. Belfast of 1971. The problem is you guys and others have done too good a job. Uh, Belfast doesn't look like Belfast 1971 anymore, except I suppose maybe there are still a few little pockets, but they're hard to find. The housing stock has changed beyond recognition. In many places, it's simply too good for a historic recreation. Uh, I remember uh, every year I used to help out take a, a party of uh, postgraduate uh, US uh, students uh, around Belfast. Uh, they were studying journalism and PR at the University of Southern California, and they would do internships in London and come to Belfast for a weekend. Uh, and uh, we used to try and hook them up with you know, kind of real life people rather than just getting the usual sort of tourism tours. These are people that, that were interested in, and I suppose, what was really going on at a grassroots level. So often we would organize a tour of the Falls and the Shankle uh, conducted by former prisoners. Uh, and uh, I remember the, the night before I was taking uh, this uh, group out the next morning, Saturday morning on, on the Falls and Shankle, one of them said to me, I'm so looking forward to seeing your slums tomorrow. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if, you don't, if, if, if you've ever been to LA, uh, the USC campus, it's an old, uh, you, know, you know, top university, uh, but its campus is pretty much cheek by jowl with some of the worst parts of LA. And I said, uh, well, if you want to see slums, I suggest you take a wander outside your university campus, because you're not really going to see that level of deprivation, uh, certainly in terms of the built environment, uh, when you walk around Belfast tomorrow. Uh, so things have changed so much, and that is good news. Uh, but of course there is uh, so much scope for more. Good quality social housing can have all sorts of social and economic benefits. Uh, we know that a sustained program of investment improves blighted lives, gives residents a pride in their home, in their area, and of course it provides jobs in the construction centre. And financed correctly, you can create this kind of virtuous circle of investment and economic return. And, you know, this, I suppose, in general, we've seen the stats from Cameron earlier on, the job that's been done here in Northern Ireland has tended to be better than average. The quality of the housing in places is definitely better than average. Uh, and I suppose it doesn't mean that we need to do less in order to come down to the average. Uh, it says that we've actually been doing one thing right here in this part of the world, and perhaps we need to do a bit more of it. Uh, and I often think it's, uh, it's funny that the housing thing doesn't really, you know, get enough backing from politicians. Maybe it, maybe it gets a bit more here, but um, it'll be interesting to hear what, what, uh, what Tim's saying on this, because you know, simply building more houses, as I say, financed correctly, can have all of these benefits, and everybody can benefit if you do it right. Uh, so it's about constructing that policy dream. It's about you uh, being part of that uh, to ensure that it's not about winners and losers, and it is about uh, basically lifting everybody up and that's the vision you have to sell. So my advice is simply keep building. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I think the, the minister asked a question this morning, why don't we say that housing makes a huge contribution to the economy? You know, why aren't we having that conversation? We need to do more of it. I think you've given us a few pointers already about how we can start to move into that space. Uh, and I'm sure we'll develop that a little bit later. Tim, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Well, it's, uh, it's great to be here. We all seem to be talking about the 1970s and when we were born. Um, one of my uh, first visits outside of uh, England was 1971. Uh, my dad was stationed in Lisbon, and I spent two of my earliest years of my life um, in uh, Northern Ireland. I can't really remember much of those times, but um, the taxi driver that picked me up from the airport last night had a very thick 
um, Northern Ireland accent, and one of the first things he said to me was, terrorism is booming, it's great to have you here. And I almost immediately turned around and um, went home, but he was talking about tourism. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope there's not so many <laughs> misunderstandings um, today. Um, Jenny Kirsty Watt Donald introduced me as a Conservative supporter, and um, I don't know whether some of you think in that case you're about to get um, some Conservative propaganda. Uh, let me just tell you a story that I know Cameron Watt has heard before, so he'll have to turn off. But um, David Cameron was once asked about the website I used to edit. It was called Conservative Home. Um, well, in fact, he wasn't asked about the website I used to edit um, called Conservative Home. He was asked about whether he would ever consider um, supporting the bombing of Iran. And he said, I would on one condition. A bomb is left in the payload, and on the way back, the bomber takes out Tim Montgomery and Conservative Home. So um, we, um, the site and my site, I hope, hopefully a reputation, certainly with the Prime Minister, for independent journalism. And what I will try and give a little bit in the short time we have today is an assessment of um, a, an independent and hopefully a fair assessment of uh, the British political scene and how it um, relates to what you're particularly interested in housing. So I want to answer or try to answer or not answer three questions. Who will win the next general election um, in the UK? More interesting question, should anyone want to win the next general election in the UK? And then what might it mean for um, housing? I think the next election is a battle not just between the Conservatives and Labour and UKIP and the SNP. It's a battle between maths and music. And all the maths really is on the side of Labour, and all the music is on the side of the Conservatives. Um, the arithmetic is hard for the Conservatives to get over. If you look at the fact that you've had this block of Liberal Democrat voters who've defected to Labour as soon as the coalition was formed, if you look at the block of Tory voters that have defected to UKIP, the Conservatives' failure to get the boundary review um, passed, if you look at um, the Tory failure to make progress in uh, Cameron's native Scotland, amongst ethnic minorities, amongst urban Britain, it's still very hard, really, to see how the Conservatives can win the next election. And you have to go back to the 1970s again, it's all 1970s today, to find out the last time a sitting Prime Minister increased the share of the vote he won at the subsequent time he went to election. That was Harold Wilson in 1974, and he only managed to increase is joked by about one and a half percent. And it's hard to see on the normal laws of gravity, political gravity, um, how David Cameron can stay in Downing Street after the next general election. But there is two words that give every Conservative encouragement, and that's Ed Miliband. <laughs> and I um, apologize to Labour supporters in the, in the room, but um, the party I do support is a ruthless party. There's no way that we would have kept Ed Miliband as party leader um, if he'd been our leader. We dumped leaders very quickly. And all of the evidence is, is that Ed Miliband is a huge recruiting sergeant for the Conservatives. There is an iron triangle of political success that usually predicts elections, and that's, are you more trusted on the economy? Who has the best leader? And which is the most united party? Normally, if two of those three things are going for you, you win elections. The Tories have about a 25% lead on economic competence over Labour. They have, in terms of prime minister, they have a 40% lead as best prime minister, um, David Cameron versus um, Ed Miliband, when party labels aren't attached. Um, only on party unity, for reasons you've all seen on your television screens day in, day out at the moment, the Tories are struggling um, a bit. But those musical notes, Growing economy, leader image should favour the Conservatives, but it's the mathematical factors that make it hard to quite see whether the Conservatives can win um, the next um, election. I don't know whether any of you remember a game called Going for Broke, um, which is a game you only won by losing the most money in the course of the game, sort of reverse of Monopoly. Well, it, all the political parties seem to be playing that game to me um, at the moment. The Conservative Party in particular um, is uh, shooting itself in the foot at every opportunity, which makes the next general election um, incredibly um, complicated. We've obviously had the rise of UKIP, 
um, which I still think represents much more of a threat to the Conservatives than any other party. If you look at the opinion polling, um, 50 to 60 percent of most UKIP um, voters used to vote Conservative. It could yet become a problem for Labour, but I don't think it's a major problem for Labour at the moment. The big problem for Labour is the SNP. You know, the, uh, the real fact is that the SNP could surge in Scotland. And that really means that Labour could do all that it needs to do in England and Wales, and then it could um, lose 15 to 20 seats in Scotland. And um, I think in Nicola Sturgeon, the SNP have a very charismatic leader and more of a social democrat, more of a left-wing leader than Alex Salmond um, was perceived, of, perceived as. And she's exactly the sort of person that could cause havoc in Labour's core vote in Glasgow and, uh, and Dundee, where, of course, yes, did win in the, in the referendum. So coalitions of every possibility are possible. It may even be that the Tories and the Liberal Democrats or Labour and the Liberal Democrats added up, couldn't form a majority after the next election. I certainly don't think any one party will win an outright majority. And of course, related to um, what we've just been hearing um, from uh, Paul and Jim about the Northern Ireland politics, one of the things that will certainly help Northern Ireland at the moment is that the DUP's votes might be necessary in any future um, coalition. I know the Conservatives are doing a lot of outreach to the DUP at the moment. Those uh, 10 or so MPs may be very useful after the next general election. Hard to predict, but England may get Miliband as Prime Minister, even if only 32% of English people vote for it. Uh, the SNP may stop Labour. Probably, likely, the Tories will get more votes, but Labour might well get more seats. It's going to really test the British electoral system um, to the edge. More interesting question, I think, is who would want to win the next general election? Um, the deficit is still huge. It's a bizarre thing, really, that now uh, Greece, Spain, uh, the Republic have all got better deficit, underlying deficit positions than the UK. They were supposed to be the um, crisis economies, and yet England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland together um, have a worse underlying um, deficit position. Not necessarily a debt position overall, but the deficit, has, as we've seen this week, has stopped falling and has actually started to go up again, uh, partly uh, because of low pay. Um, it's, you don't need to be uh, an economist to work out that if you're um, not earning very much money, you can't also pay much tax. And the real problem of low pay now in the economy is becoming a problem um, of the, the, the deficit. And austerity is incredibly uneven. Perhaps the most interesting fact about the nature of the state that's emerging in this era of austerity is how unbalanced it is. We're now, for the first time, spending half of, um, half of government spending on health and welfare and pensions. Um, and those, of course, are the protected budgets. Um, some budgets, like justice, policing, uh, local government, social care, um, have been cut very, very dramatically. And it does make it hard to see where the next part of the cuts are going to come from. The cuts have fallen so hard on some parts of the state um, that it's very difficult to see where the further economies are going to uh, come from there. And then if you, I don't know whether any of you have been, heard the Today programme this morning and the, the crisis of funding facing the National Health Service. Most of the programme was dedicated to it. The uh, chief executive of the NHS talking about £8 billion of extra spending just to keep the NHS as we know it now on the road. Um, incredibly hard um, fiscal uh, decisions ahead. But uh, I wish it wasn't the case but I'm beginning to wonder whether actually we will, as all of the political parties are promising, eliminate the deficit in the next parliament. The Chancellor, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, this was supposed to be their central project, was elimination of the deficit in this parliament. They're not even halfway there. They're only a third of the way there, and they're going backwards. But you know what? There's no political price for it. And if there's no political price for it, why are the government going to make the cuts um, that um, they say they will. Now, I think they should make the cuts, because if we don't make the cuts, the uh, interest rate burden that will deny investment in 
schools and hospitals, housing will carry on. It makes us vulnerable to Eurozone shock. It means that, you know, potentially we are thrown into a crisis um, further down the road. But there seems to me a big question now, given the lack of political consequences for the coalition's failure to meet its defining project, which was to eliminate the deficit, as to whether actually they will pursue, persevere with that project. So finally on housing, it has become uh, the top five issue um, according to voters. That's what uh, Shelter say, um, and if you look at it now, the old argument that rising house prices were very good for political parties, only 25% of voters now say that they actually benefit and want rising house prices, and about two-thirds say they don't want rising house prices. Those are people stuck on um, the housing ladder in cramped accommodation or, or just wanting to um, get out of living with mum and dad. So housing on the face of it should be something that is much more potent as um, an electoral issue. The problem is a lot of the opinion polls that are quoted are quoted of the electorate as a whole, which you may think is a very sensible thing to do. But of course what really matters is opinion polls of people who vote. And we do know that there are about roughly twice as many old people as young people, and old people are almost twice as likely to vote. And when you start um, opinion polling the people that do vote, all those calculations of housing being such a big issue narrow dramatically. And the Conservative Party, a key part of its electoral strategy is to get the grey vote out. Of course, most of the grey vote have homes. They don't want their backyards built in, and it changes um, the calculations quite um, dramatically. But uh, the Tories at some point, uh, I'm majoring on the Tories because I think if you look at, for example, at local government um, where, where houses are being built, it's in Tory local authorities where house building is weakest. Um, the Tories at some point do have to face up to the fact, and put this crudely, if you want to create more Labour voters, you increase the number of people dependent upon benefits. If you want to increase the number of Tory voters, you have to increase the people who have their own homes. Either they own them or they feel that they've got a stake in the community through some sorts of partnership. And the Conservatives really do need to look at the fact that they haven't now won a general election since 1992 outright. Um, don't look like they're going to win the next general election. And a large part of that reason is the decline in home ownership. It's a massive link between people who feel they have a stake in society and um, home ownership. And the Conservatives really need to get over that. And I think there are three things that give me encouragement on that front. Um, first of all, there is another coalition in government at the moment, not just between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. There's one that's hardly noticed, but it's a coalition between Labour in the North and a brilliant minister called Greg Clark, the Minister for Cities. Um, strategic partnerships are developing all over the country called the City Deals, where planning, transport, across local government deals are being sorted and housing isn't going to become a big part of that. And that will lay the foundation potentially for a garden city movement and it's much easier to build a large number of houses in a small number of places than a small number of houses in a large number of places. A right to build I think will be a key part of the next uh, Tory manifesto. Um, a right to build which means that if someone wants to build an underused uh, local authority or public sector land, they will be able to um, go and exercise a right to build in that territory, which will break, begin to break the monopoly of large house builders. <coughs> and the final thing that uh, encourages me is that um, we are really, we, are, we will have a, probably a coalition. The country will probably have a coalition. And if the Conservatives are in coalition with uh, Labour or the Liberal Democrats, which are more pro-house building, we recently had the Lions House Building Review, that will probably pull the Conservatives um, more towards a pro-house building uh, position. Thank you very much. Okay, I
I've got a long list of questions, but um, given that we have about 20 minutes or so, I thought what we'll do is open it up to the floor immediately, because I'm sure quite a few people have some issues or comments or questions that they'd like to, to raise at this point. So if you have something that you'd like to say or a question you'd like to ask of our panel, could you put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you as soon as possible. Microphone to the front row, please. Um, and can you just give us your name and uh, what, what you're representing here today, please? Didn't think I'd be that lucky in the drawing. <laughs> uh, John McAllister, MLA for Southdown Constituency, so Northern Ireland Assembly, one of um, that really great functioning body. Um, a couple of things from all of the, the speakers. Uh, I noticed even uh, Paul McAlean talking about, about housing um, and about how we mix housing, all of that. I, I wouldn't mind more, more of your thoughts on that, both on the socioeconomic as well as just our are the Northern Ireland tribal um, position. Um, round uh, the interest in talking here and Tim talk about the NHS and how much we're currently spending on that. It's estimated in Northern Ireland we would need to raise our health service spending by 6% per year just almost to keep up with, with demand. Unlikely that we can find that level of resources. Also an interesting point about no political price to pay. It's one of my large Huge criticism I have of our system. People in the room may know that I'm doing a, a bill about bringing a, a, trying to create an opposition in the Stormont Assembly. I'd also say, as well as creating an opposition, we almost need to create a government in Stormont because we have ministers that go off doing their own things, and there is no political price to pay for failure to agree anything, and that's something that we need to change. Ministers going about announcing good things are good, bad things are bad but we don't want to touch any of the other uh, difficult things. So it's, it's round that, you know, both um, yourself, Tim, and, and Jim, commenting round that political price and how you change that, you know, and, and heaven forbid we end up with a, a conservative UKIP DUP coalition or something, um, a government of all the talents. Um, I would also say round uh, some of the issues for the three of you around land, uh, you know, how, I mean, the message I'm getting here from today is that you would build more houses if you could get land. We had a presentation, and Tim talked about the rise of house price. Presentation at yesterday's finance committee said if house prices had risen at a steady 2% per year between 01 and 11, uh, Northern Ireland um, citizens would have collectively about 5.6 billion less in debt. 5.6 billion? I mean, that's a huge figure. So the levels of personal debt, the, the value of, uh, uh, of homes, that's a huge factor. And what do we need to do to change that, to, to bring that be a huge amount of money that's swirling about the economy if we weren't all paying it off in interest? So, uh, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe we'll, we'll start with that, um, that point about no political price for, for failure. And particularly with a coalition government, the need for a strong opposition is perhaps greater than ever. Would you, would you agree with that, Tim? Oh, sorry, and a microphone on the table just there for you. I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, I, think, I think it is ultimately about the calibre of politicians. And I, I think one of the reasons why the... Um, I, I won't comment too much on Northern Ireland politics because I don't know enough to speak with authority. But I think one of the problems that we don't have, George Osborne is not facing a political price for the failure to deal with the deficit in the UK, is because Labour aren't trusted on the economy. And so every time they talk about the economy, they, they suffer um, from that. They want to the, the election to be about the, the National Health Service. So, you know, a lot of it is about calibre of... Um, politicians and why for the moment I think this is the politicians we have certainly in the UK at the moment I think the weakest set we've had in living memory I can't remember a time when there wasn't a Thatcher or a Blair or someone that dominated uh, the political conversation the three most charismatic politicians in Britain Alex Salmon, Boris Johnson, Nigel Farage none of them are party leaders. Um, just on your point about um, land what being fair to the Labour Party I thought the Lions review on housing just published a couple of weeks ago last week um, was, was very interesting on land. And I think we do need to get to a point where underused land after a certain period is taxed because so many developers do hold back land 
hoping for a movement in prices that makes that development um, more advantageous to them. And I think we do need to introduce um, quite penal rates of tax on underused land, um, which will be the, I think, unlock enormous amount of uh, house building potential. I, I might come in very quickly just <coughs> on the land point, because that is a huge frustration for us as a sector, um, particularly because we're aware of sites, perhaps in the public sector, held by government departments or local authorities, um, and also stuff that's held by the banks as well. And if we could just get access to those, and also if those sites were brought forward and they were actually sale ready and they were developable and not you know, heavily contaminated, housing associations feel that they could do a lot more to deliver the homes that are needed. I agree there's a lot more that we could do centrally. I think some of the, the ideas coming out of the Lions um, review around having a sort of a, a coordinating and um, a body responsible for bringing together sites and land assembly and making them um, ready for development is an interesting one and, and something that would warrant further exploration. I think that's probably something that we'll touch on in our session this afternoon about delivering the homes that Northern Ireland needs as well. Paul, do you want to come in a bit on, on the mixed tenure? Um, well, a couple of things. Uh, Jim, of course, is right. Uh, I, I wasn't born twice. The word I used, should have used was alive. I was alive <laughs> in 74, alive in 72, and unfortunately alive in 71. Um, so um, Jim's the sharp journalist, as he always was. Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, the mixed tenure thing, uh, and, and I don't... I know there are some examples uh, in other cities uh, around the world, uh, plenty of examples in other cities around the world, particularly in America, um, France, etc. But some examples in Britain. But I think you know there's a there's a major job to be done to convince um, private sector developers and housing associations who fell into your arms in the, in, in in the bad days uh, when they when all of a sudden you know social housing became a very uh, a convenient way to get out of of on performing housing developments, but you know I think we have to do it, and I think we have to build a bridge uh, in a better way and a better understanding of the potential for it. And in the same way, John, uh, and it's very good to see you here today that the um, that small steps have been taken, for instance, by Newington, in one of the toughest interface areas anywhere in this uh, in this region, anywhere in Northern Ireland, that they've managed to do a, a cross community housing development right on an interface. I mean, it's an outstanding achievement. And it's not the only one, but it's a, it is a, a shining beacon. And people have taken a leap of faith. And there's a leap of faith required in, in, in mixed tenure as well. And then once it's demonstrated to work, then we have to do everything that we can to make sure that that message gets put across and that it's seen to work. And it's seen to work for the private sector, it's seen to work for the housing associations, and it's seen to work, most importantly, for the tenants themselves. That, and that will require a number of things, good management, you know, well, um, you know, uh, well structured and, and, uh, and well proportioned and properly uh, um, delivered uh, development. So there's a, there's a whole range of factors in there that I think that can make it work and absolutely a, a very good and compelling reason to make it work. Jim, were you going to? Um, <clears throat> I'll just pick up on, on your political point, uh, John, in terms of even from, from the UK and then through to Northern Ireland. I mean, it's obviously, it, like in, in terms of economics, but also in terms of, uh, I suppose, how we all behave, it's all to do with um, incentives. And I think the point that uh, Tim made about how the, the old and the elderly have a, have a greater influence on policy is actually a big problem. Uh, and, and there is an unfairness that's now crept into the system as to how the resources are allocated. One solution to that perhaps would be to have um, online voting. Uh, you know, so perhaps by the next election, if they had a system where everybody could vote from their app or their iPad or whatever, would actually engage young people and they would act, their say would be heard. And then when you come to Northern Ireland, of course, the incentives are entirely different here because the political settlement was all about getting orange and green together and then let's worry about the practicalities thereafter. It hasn't done a brilliant job in terms of the practicalities and we're seeing stresses obviously still with the orange and green. Uh, so I think if you, unless you reconstruct the incentives in a much better way, you're not going to get better government. Uh, and that applies just about to every policy area, whether it's housing or anything else. Kick in on that as well. Um, the uh, you know the, the most depressing thing that's that, that's hit me over the last few weeks is, is watching one executive minister take a judicial review of another executive minister's decision. I mean, where and what other cabinet in the world do you go to law uh, to examine? Although it's happened already in Northern Ireland, but I, I was embarrassed. I mean, I was going like I, I despaired of reading, reading of that in the paper, uh, particularly because the Belfast Metropolitan Area Plan is so important and has been so long in its development. But I mean, Jim's totally right. That's the structure that we that we've created, uh, and uh, I, but there does need to be 
um, uh, an effective uh, opposition uh, and I think there has to be an effective calling to account and I'm not sure the committee system is strong enough uh, in the Assembly to do that uh, and, and I think there has to be very strong voices that are not part of the uh, the executive that, that are willing to really stand up and be counted and in the same way uh, uh, as Tim talks about Farage uh, etc I mean you have to you have to recognize the voice of Jim Allister Jim Allister is a very effective oppositional voice uh, in Westminster, whether you agree with the things that he says or some of the positions that he takes. He's a very effective uh, 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 voice of opposition. Okay, I've got a question that was submitted uh, a little bit earlier. It's been directed to you, Jim, but um, I'm thinking everybody will probably have some thoughts on this. Do you think we will see welfare reform in place uh, in the next 12 months? It's, uh, you know, I have to I write a piece um, for the Sunday Business Post now, which is probably more in terms of the, uh, political analysis. Uh, and it's, uh, it's always very difficult because it, it's, uh, Northern Ireland politics is like Alice in Wonderland. It's, or it's, even, it's like one of those science fiction films, you know, where everything keeps changing and you realise there's no point in watching this movie because anything can happen at any mo moment, this whole sort of deus ex machina thing. And that's uh, just very, very hard to call. Um, I, one thing I, I would have, you know, bet my house on uh, was that Sinn Féin wouldn't want to do a, a deal uh, that would uh, look bad for them uh, going into a, a, an election in the Republic. Okay. Having said that, I've talked to people in the DUP recently who are quite sanguine about things and uh, think that they'll, they'll get over their troubles, whether or not that's just a message that's been put out there, I'm not sure. Uh, again, look at incentives. There are, there are uh, opportunities for both sides, even in uh, collapse. So. I think my, my inclination would be to say that there cannot be a deal on welfare reform, but does that mean that something else comes out of the blue, you know, in a sense which just delays the inevitable on that? I don't know. Uh, we've already seen the £100 million loan. How far will that get us? I don't know. But uh, I, I don't think there'll be a deal on welfare reform. There might be something imposed, but I'm not sure if there'll be a deal. Okay. Tim, what, what's your sense of how Northern Ireland's uh, reluctance to take forward the welfare reform bill is viewed in Westminster? Um, I think it's a essential that Northern Ireland does embrace welfare reform. I think it may get easier because um, if I had to name the thing that I think as a Conservative I'm proudest that this government is trying to do, um, it is the universal credit. Um, now the universal credit has a bad press in the sense it's had lots of technical problems, it's been uh, rolled out much more slowly than was anticipated. Um, but compared to, for example, Obamacare, which was introduced in one big bang and, um, and has hit all the problems that it did, it's almost a model of how you should introduce a program, the universal credit is coming in stages. And the evidence from employers and from participants in the Northwest and in Hammersmith that are using it, and I've been um, two job centres in three job centres now where universal credit is being rolled out is they love it. Because the universal credit works in a narrow set. People associate universal credit mainly with the fact that it always ensures you're better.